Welcome back to Fury Cat. First, we'll make sure to like this video, subscribe, and of course, smash the bell for notifications. And don't forget to sign up to the mailing list for my new graphic novel, illustrated by the world famous Ebi Canales. Sign up now. The link is in the description. My guest today has been doing stand-up comedy for over 20 years. He's toured with bands such as The Newsboys, Third Day, and Mercy Me. He's also authored three books and a podcast under the brand he created and calls The Adventures of Average Boy. Please welcome my friend, Bob Smiley. What's going on, Bob? How's it going? <laughs> it's going great, man. How you how you doing? Where where are you uh, living these days? I uh, live north of Houston. Uh, I live in a town called the Woodlands. Um, I'm going to tell anybody that knows the Woodlands. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say I'm not rich um, because the the Woodlands is a a town just north of Houston, and it, it's far enough away that you can't really smell Houston, but it's close enough to use their airport. Um, but it is very, very, it's a very affluent area. So when I say I'm from the Woodlands, people are like, oh, and I'm like, no, no, no. Because like, if there's a fire, the firemen only use bottled water here. Like it is very like, just, I don't know, kind of snooty and stuff. But um, yeah, we just, we, I got a house here. Uh, I think whenever the housing markets and everything, I think it was like 2008 or something. Oh and yeah. Housing, and the crash. Yeah, and I was working I was like, in home building, so I, yeah, I, I remember that I got laid off January '09. So yeah, okay, there you go. So I just thought, well, let's just see if I can get a house, you know, here. And I put in an offer, and the guy I didn't know this at the time, but the guy had three homes, and he was upside down in all of them. So he just like I just got it, and so yeah, I live in the woodlands. So that for so, all, all the stalkers out there. Okay, because I'm. I guess I confused myself somewhere. We met at um at a, at a show you played about a year ago, and I thought you weren't local. I live here in Houston, and so yeah. I had no idea you were you were just 45, 50 minutes away from me. So. Yeah, you could have you could have driven up. We could have done this in the kitchen. <laughs> well, I'm glad we got it together. So uh, <laughs> I had I I had a. Uh... I ordered pizza one time and had it delivered. And the, the guy, I opened the door and the guy looked at me weird and uh, I, I was playing with my kids. And so I, I thought he looked at me weird cause I was wearing a cape and I took the pizza, um, tipped him, thankfully tipped him well. And, and then the next day I was mowing and he drove into our neighborhood slowly and he had his daughter with him and I was out mowing. And so I looked at him and he, he pulled over and he goes, I'm so sorry, but I recognized you when I delivered the pizza and my daughter's like a big fan of your average boy series. And I just wanted her to see where you lived. I didn't know you'd be out here mowing. So it was, it was a strange, I was like, dude, give me some pizza coupons. <laughs> well, yeah, let's get into uh, everything you got going on. But first, uh, take me back to uh, a young Bob as a child. Where'd you grow up and what was your childhood like? My childhood was awesome. Uh, I have amazing parents. Uh, most comedy comes out of like pain and, you know, a lot of comics are depressed and stuff. And um, I, I didn't have any of that. I grew up in a very loving home. Uh, I grew up in, uh, started in Cedar Hill outside of Dallas. We moved to Weatherford uh, outside of Fort Worth. And then uh, my dad took a superintendent job at this little town called Era. Uh, at the time, it had 281 people in the town. Uh, my dad's joke was our idea of a large industrial company was a 200 pound Avon lady. Like that, that was his joke. I would, I would never tell that, but that was his joke. Um, but yeah, it had a little uh, store and a school and that was it. And so I grew up in this very, very tiny little country town and uh, I had 17 in my graduating class. So wow. kind of a, yeah, it was, it was fun though. Um, How do you get into trouble? with 17 you you know everybody by name literally everybody knew everybody like yeah it, it you <laughs> yeah it was it was you were very watched so i was i was thankfully a pretty good kid so i didn't uh i didn't get into a lot of trouble but i had a lot of friends that that got in trouble and i hung out with them so i could help them you know i tell people i was building a testimony at the time <laughs> and so were you uh involved in the church were your parents involved with the church or 
Yeah, we went to a church. I love in, the way we say the church, like 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 this, like it's all the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to the church um, in Gainesville, and um, was very active in my youth group. And um, yeah, we went every every time the doors were open. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, lock in. Sometimes my parents would just drop me off there, even if it wasn't open. You know, just like just see if you can, you know, get through a window. Um, so yeah, I grew up a, a Christian. It's kind of a boring testimony. My, uh, friend, it's like a Tim non-denominational Hawk. or no, it's church of Christ. Church of Christ. Oh, they're it's pretty church. strict, right? Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, oh. they follow the Bible. So <laughs> <laughs> if the Bible's strict, then yeah, it was, uh, uh, yeah, we, they, I don't know, because Church of Christ doesn't have a governing board, so all Church of Christ are kind of like different. So some actually now even have uh, instrumental music and stuff. Um, I really like the acapella. I was in uh, Dallas this weekend doing a show uh, for this youth conference called Winterfest, and it was 3,200 kids just singing, like, you know, like four-part harmony. and oh, wow. It was so cool. But yeah, I grew up uh, Church of Christ. Um, I started to say my friend Tim Hawkins has a, a comedy bit like because his testimony and my testimony are kind of boring because we both grew up, you know, relatively good kids. And he's like, you see somebody up there at church giving their testimony and you're sitting in the back going, man, I wish I was addicted to crack. Like I've got a boring testimony. But th- that that is uh, kind of the case is like I grew I went to a, a Christian. Uh, I went to Abilene Christian University. Um, so I went to a Christian college and. Yeah, pretty much, uh, you know, tried to follow Jesus uh, all my life. Also, at a young age, you, you became a follower of Christ, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, My parents did a great job in raising me because I was very strong willed. So they they, you know, made me go to church, but they didn't really they wanted my relationship to be my own relationship. Uh, with Christ. And so they didn't really like force it down my throat. They said, this is what we believe. This is what we've, you know, we've looked into this. We've um, so, and I respected my parents. So I like, I was like, okay, if they believe this, then I want to look into it. And, you know, and so, yeah, they kind of let me make my own decisions and stuff. So then you're, you're in uh you said, what university were you at? Uh, Abilene Christian. Their you're motto is, you can't put a price on Christian education, but man, they build me for it. <laughs> we can try. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they definitely they they found a price somehow. And was that a good experience? Yeah, it was great. Um, uh, I joined a fraternity, and you know, had a really good group of friends, and you know, everybody was. I mean, you know, college kids are kind of becoming adults and you know so there was some debauchery and stuff it wasn't a a bubble of purity or anything but um, for the most part it was you know kids trying to do the right thing and uh, you know trying to keep their life on the right path and stuff and so you had a lot of good influences around you and and stuff like that and is this where you first started doing comedy I I first did comedy um my first stand-up was uh, I had just started dating a girl and um, her mom passed away uh, from cancer. And she was uh, in and uh, they lived in a town just close to Abilene. And so I went uh, to the funeral and, <laughs> this is a, this is a, and brought this is the comedy. You, yeah, this is not how you start comedy. We the went funny to thing her- about dying is it was yeah. Seinfeld all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um they uh so afterwards we went to uh her youth groups uh her youth leader's house and uh, like all the kids came over and, and were hanging out and her youth leader came over to me and said uh, all right everybody's in the living room i'm going to get up and uh, make some remarks and then we just need like 10 minutes or something like that and i was like 10, 10 minutes what and he said oh, stand up and i was like i I don't do stand up. And he goes, no, no, I've heard you're like super funny. Like it, it'll be great. And then he just walked up out to the living room and introduced me. And so I just, well, let, I me, like, let me back up. Let me back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Basically you're at, this is after the funeral. So this is after mm-hmm. she's in the ground. Yeah. Okay. The worst possible time. Um, worst people are, are crying and she was a beloved woman, like an amazing woman. And, and you've you know, never I, done stand up, never done stand up. And is it amazing to you how like people do this with creative things? Like 
they all they think it's all easy. Oh, mm-hmm. I've heard you make people laugh. Go give me go give me a tight ten. Yeah, give me a tight ten. Come on, do your set. And I was like, uh, I don't have uh, any material <laughs> or anything. And so I just went up there and I made jokes about the town because it was a small town, and I had jokes about my small town. So you know, I was able to uh, do that. And then I did uh, some jokes about the Abilene Zoo um because it was really small and you know kind of a weird zoo and so i did jokes about that and i'm trying to think and then i stole i think i stole a seinfeld bit that i'd heard um at this point you gotta steal (laughs) yeah yeah you gotta you you gotta make it you know yeah i was up there just like okay here we go so i did that and then i did uh, my junior year in college they had a stand-up competition because they it was high school weekend so they wanted to have all these you know fun activities and stuff. So they they got a stand up competition and I didn't sign up to do it because, again, everybody all through my life told me that I should do stand up. But I never thought I could do it. You know, I, I love comedy, but I never thought I could, you know, actually do it. And the night before the competition, the lady was putting it on, called me and was like, hey, how come you didn't sign up for the um, stand up competition? And I was like, I, I know everybody says that I could do stand up, but I, I don't think I can do stand up. And she said, well, and you had to perform your act in front of an eight panel board to make sure that it was like clean. And I was like, I'm definitely not doing that, standing in front of eight people and, you know, trying to do a bit to to pass on to the competition. Like auditioning <clears> for <throat> SNL or something. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, I just, it was never something that I thought I, I could do. And she was very diplomatic about her phrasing because I was known as being really cheap on um, campus. And she goes, well, we know how frugal you are. So we thought the cash prize would have enticed you. And I was like, wait a minute, I, I don't know about the cash prize. There's a cash prize. And she was like, yeah, it's like $500 for first prize. And then I think, um, I don't know, 200 for second and then 150 for third. And I was like, well, well, can we get the panel together? I'll do that. Like, you know, and she was like, no, I'm not even worried about you being dirty. Just show up. And she actually I said, how many comics were you wanting to have? And she said, well, we wanted 10, but we have if you'll if you'll do it, we'll have nine. And so I was like, what if I wrote for my roommate and like because he could do impressions. And so I knew I could write stuff for him. And uh, she was like, yeah, one night you become a, a stand up and a writer and a writer. And so I wrote uh, I wrote a set for me and then I wrote a set uh, for him and he had a couple of bits that he was going to do. And so it, we showed up. I did it. I won. Not because I was good. Everybody else was terrible. Like one guy had a big sombrero and his whole act was like leaning over the front row going, should it shouldn't have sat on the front row. And my sombrero is going to fall on you. Yeah, that was the response that he got. Um, but my roommate got third place. And I was actually more impressed by that. Yeah. I thought I was I was going to be a teacher. I was I, my degree was in elementary ed. And so I thought, um, ooh, maybe during the summers I can write scripts or something and uh, be able to, uh, you know, send in like sitcom scripts or something. And maybe I could be a writer also. So I was actually more impressed by that. But anyway, so I did stand up there and then I did stand up one other time for my fraternity. They were having um, a banquet and you had to pay for you and your date and it was like 75 bucks and so i asked him i said hey if i do stand up can i can we go for free and again frugal and um so they let me do that so i did stand up for that um and then uh i graduated before i became a teacher i wanted to see what it was like to actually make money and uh, since teachers don't uh i started doing photography we had a family friend that owned a photography business in dallas And so I did that and I was going to do that for like a year um, to kind of, you know, I'd be debt free and, you know, kind of have a little nest egg and and stuff. And because I'm very anti debt. And so I was doing that and I was driving on 635, this freeway in Dallas. This is going to tell everybody how old I am, but my pager went off. I made that kind of money. And um, yeah. And I looked and it was area code 615, which I didn't know was Nashville, but I pulled over at a Cracker Barrel payphone and called this number. And this guy was like, hey, um, my name is Rick Wooten and uh, uh, we hung out in college and I'm road managing a guy named Clay Cross. And we're about to leave for tour. And Clay's a singer. 
And uh, we're uh, we just had a meeting and Clay said it'd be fun to have a comedian come out and kind of keep the crowd entertained and stuff. And he said, I saw you do that stand up competition our junior year and I thought you were good. Um, so I've got to hire a guy to do merch, you know, to to set up the merch table and sell merch uh, during the, the show on the tour. Um, so we can pay you for that. But really, we want you out on tour to do stand up and keep the crowd entertained and stuff. Um, so he goes, do you want to go on tour? So I'd done stand up three times in my life and I'm standing at a Cracker Barrel payphone and I'm like, how long's the tour? And he told me and I was like, OK, you know, I was so flippant about it. I didn't know it was about to completely change my life. And so I flew to Nashville, got off a plane, got on a tour bus and went out as a comedian which is not how you do it. it. Kids come to my shows and they'll come up afterwards and they're like, I want to be a comedian. How do I do it? And I'm like, do a stand-up competition your junior year in college and wait for somebody to call you. Duh. You know, which is not how you do it. So it's easy. But that's how, you don't have that's to, do. you don't have to hit the road for like 10, 15 years. Yeah. So, yeah. so what was that tour like? It was baptism by fire. Like it, um, and clay had these moving lights that kept breaking. And so, Every time they would break, they would send me up to stall. And so that's where I learned how to do crowd work. And that's where I had I learned how whenever I got to the town, I would look around and start writing bits about the town. So, I, you know, so there'd be local humor for the crowd and stuff like that. But it was man, there were there were some rough nights of just up there. And I did a, I did a merch pitch where I wore all the shirts on stage and I would take them off one by one. And I had jokes that I'd written for each one. Like anointed was a, a band that was traveling with us. And so they just had a shirt that had a big a on it. So I'd, you know, I'd go anointed has a shirt with a big a on it. Some of you college kids, it's your only chance to get an a, you better take advantage of it. You know, so just dumb stuff like that, but the crowd loved it. And I would take the shirts off one by one. And I can't believe I got away with this, but I would actually stop about halfway through and I'd go, by the way, I want to point out, I am the only Christian stripper uh, working <laughs> on tour, but with a body like mine, girls usually chant, put it on, put it on, you know, like I would do jokes like that. And uh, so I just, man, I was just out there just learning, trying to stay alive. I honestly thought I would go out for a week and then they would just send me home. You know, really? so I thought well, I'll go out and try this and I'll get to, you know, be on a tour bus for a week and, you know, until I get fired. And uh, so I did that. And then uh, the newsboys saw me and uh -oh, they asked, for those for the uninitiated in Christendom, he's dropping big names now. <laughs> boys. Now, was this they've changed singers so much, but there was this back in the day with their original singer and the 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 drummer in the cage and all that stuff they used to do. Yeah, it was um, John James was the front man. Um, Peter Furler was actually on drums, but then he would come out and sing uh, some songs. So it was before Peter even like took over. Uh, it was back then. It was called the Take Me to Your Leader Tour. And so it was it was an awesome. It's probably one of the best shows I've ever seen. Like they had spaceships that they would um, lower themselves down on the um, stage and they had these glasses with lights on them. So they'd be looking around in this, you know, pitch black arena and you'd see these like alien eyes looking and the spaceships would come down and they would get off the spaceships and the spaceships would then turn up and become video screens. And yeah, the, the tour was, and it was crazy. Cause again, I grew up in a town with 281 people in it. And now I'm standing in front of four or 5,000 people a night pretending I'm a comedian, you know, just trying to keep the crowd entertained. Well, how did that happen? How what was the divine connect on that? What do you mean? How did you get that gig? Well, the newsboys saw me on the Clay Cross tour, and they liked the idea of having a comedian entertain the crowd in between the bands, like when they're setting up and doing all that stuff. And they liked that I did a merch pitch that was funny, like it was a comedy bit, and so it helped push merchandise. You know, which is how bands stay on the road, and so. Uh, they were like, yeah, we want you to do that merch pitch. And, you know, and so they just, they took me out and, and Peter and uh, um, Phil Joel, the bass player. Uh, I don't know why, but they just really liked me. And I worked hard. Like I would always volunteer to do extra stuff and help with loadout and all that. And they came from the school of hard knocks as well. Like they worked really hard in the early years uh, to take every advantage they could. And so they just liked that work ethic in me. So 
I ended up touring with them. I think I did four or five tours with them. Uh, and Peter and Phil would, they would talk to um, festival promoters and all that and tell them like, oh, you got to bring Smiley in to MC your festival. And so that was like a big, huge push uh, is getting my name out there was the newsboys were like vouching for me. Dude, that's awesome. So how long were you with the newsboys? So I did, I did that tour the take me to your leader tour. I did a whole year of that. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, the super tones, uh, again, saw me and asked me to tour with them. And so I toured now, with now, them. now you're getting into my wheelhouse, the super tone. All right, yeah. let's see, let's play the game. So I toured with plank eye. Do you know plank eye? Mm -hmm. Plank eye. Yes. Yeah. So I've toured with plank eye and then the super tones. Um, and then I did my own little tour with a guy named Riley Armstrong, uh, we traveled just in his van. He had a big white van that he named Elvis uh, because it was big and it always pulled into uh, fast food drive-ins. <laughs> um, so we called it Elvis. And so we did that tour. Um, and then the Newsboys uh, took me on their uh, Love Liberty disco tour, which was interesting because they were wearing all white suits. And so the Newsboys wanted me to wear this white disco suit. Uh, and I just bleached my hair blonde. So I look like a used Q-tip. Like it was not, it was not a good look, but I did that tour. And then I did a uh, festival con Dios, which was a big traveling. Like we had 11 Christian bands. Uh, we had uh, a speaker, we had a motorcycle ramp um, and we had a motorcycle show. It was, it was like a circus. And so I did all three years of those, uh, of that tour emceeing, you know, doing five minute bits in between each act. And so, yeah, it, it, I, I started out in a very, very weird way doing comedy for bands and stuff, but it was tough. There were nights where there were 800 kids in a, you know, with no chairs in a warehouse and they're chanting super tones, super tones. And I'm like, uh, Hey guys, let me tell you some jokes about my grandma. You know, like it was, you know, they didn't want to listen or anything. So it was, it was tough, but you know, I just kept doing it because I felt like that's where God wanted me at the time. And so I just kept doing it. And it like eventually like youth leaders would see me make their youth group laugh. And so then they would then hire me to come back and do a full show for their youth group. Yeah, that's what I was was thinking. Your name is really being built up at this time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because everybody because no comic was touring with bands. Like they just, that just wasn't a thing. And so I was, and I didn't know that there was a lot of Christian comics out there. You know, I knew Jeff Allen, uh, Mark Lowry, Shonda Pierce, Ken Davis. Those were kind of the big four horsemen of Christian comedy, but they were doing their own tours. And so I didn't know there was anybody else out there. And I remember I, um, I, I met, I was at, uh, uh, what was it called? Uh, Spirit West Coast, uh, this festival out in California. And there was another comedian there named Ron McGee. And I was sitting in the um, green room tent and I, I sat down kind of close to him because I didn't know I didn't know anything about comics. Like if you were allowed to go up and talk to him or, you know, anything, even though I was one. And you hadn't, you hadn't done like you hadn't like gone to the store or, you know, the, you hadn't, you know, the seller. You, you yeah. hadn't hit any of the spots. You hadn't. No, I hadn't done any of that. I, I, I actually did Zanies because Jeff Allen was hosting one night. And he heard about me. And so he uh, put me on the show. And that was the first comedy club I ever did was Zanies in Nashville. Um, and so I met Jeff Allen and he was super nice and he had no business. Like he, he I don't know why he put me on a show. It was, it was very, very nice. And he was, that was like the first one. Um, but then I, I was sitting at this festival and Ron turned to me and he goes, Smiley, how come you don't talk to all of us? And I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, all us Christian comedians. And I was like, wait a minute, us? Like there, there's more out there? Like it it kind of blew my mind. There was like this whole community of comedians out there that, you know, would do stuff together and all that because I was just touring with bands and didn't know. And so he introduced me to a lot of other uh, Christian comedians. And I was like, oh, so there's other people out there doing this. Like I didn't, I didn't know because it was before you know, YouTube hadn't been invented. And, you know, so you didn't know about all this. It was kind of hard to, you know, find out. I have to ask, because I am a Supertones fan. What was it like being on tour with the Supertones? Did they, they strike were, back? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I did the uh, 
Gallaluya tour, I think it was called. It was them and um, Five Iron Frenzy. Mm-hmm. Oh, and, yeah. Oh, yeah. I used to listen to Five Iron. And there was another ska band, and I forget what, what their name was. But the Supertones, they were all great guys. And Mojo, the lead singer, was a huge comedy fan. And so I, w- I would write a joke every night for him to do on stage because he 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 wanted to do stand up like he was he was a really funny guy. And so um, he would he would always like tell one joke every night on stage. And they were just they were just great guys, like fun and like super good Christian guys. Like, you know, like you you hear all these stories of, you know, like Christian bands aren't really who they, who they are. You know, they say they are. And um, the joke is, you know, they're they're driving away in their tour bus, waving to fans, but they got a beer underneath the window, you know, and like that. And now I, all those all the guys I toured with were legit genuine great dudes uh third day newsboys supertones like all those guys were were in it for the right reasons so you toured with third day as well that's probably the biggest name well i guess them and newsboys they were like the biggest groups at the at one point in time yeah third day was um they were on that uh first newsboys tour so it was plank eye third day and the newsboys uh and then uh man maybe in 2008 or something uh third day called me. And by that point I was just doing my own shows. I wouldn't touring with any other bands, but they asked me to tour with them uh, again. And so I was like, Oh yeah, I gotta, I gotta do this. Cause they're just fun guys. So I went out and that was actually the last like big tour that I did was with third day. And I think it was the, the year before they split up. If I, if I remember correctly, but yeah, they're, yeah, they were, they were big touring bands, man. Yeah, it's it's great because I saw them at the Woodlands, um, the Woodlands, and you know, at the Pavilion. Pavilion, yeah, they have yeah. this. Uh, it's a big outdoor amphitheater, and um, it was their first tour, and I believe it was the last show. Oh, okay. Um, and you know, there's the the seating down below. Then there's the up. What do you just call it? Just the the grass. You can see yeah, the grass, yeah, the lawn. Know, yeah, they lawn. call it the lawn. Uh, up top um and um we were down below in the good seats and it wasn't even half full and i remember the lead singer coming out just thanking everybody for coming saying hey this is the biggest crowd we've had all all tour yeah and one of the girls i was with a group you know one of the girls in the group looks around and goes what like it, it was such a small it seemed like a small intimate thing because the woodlands is a big big amphitheater yeah. you know um and then you know next thing you know they're just the biggest band yeah, Christian Matt band. Powell is just amazing. Like his his voice is, I think, one of the best voices out there. Yeah, yeah. Is, what is he? Is he still singing? I thought he had some problems with his throat or something. Or no, that was Mark Stewart um, okay. from Audio A. Yeah, okay, he, lost, he lost his voice, and um, so no, Mac. So when Third Day disbanded, um, Mac started uh, Mac Powell and the Family Reunion. Um, he or he actually put out. I think two solo projects and then he started Mac Powell and the family reunion. And then he toured that for, I don't know, two or three years. And then I, I just saw him recently. He actually played here in the woodlands at Dosey Doe. And so we went to see him and uh, that, that was Mac, Fa- Mac Powell and the family reunion. And I think that was the last, like one of the last shows that they did as that. And then lately he's just been touring with himself. I just saw the newsboys uh, here in Tomball, um, which is by Houston. Uh, they came through town. And so we went to that and Mac Powell was actually uh, the middle guy um, on that, on that tour. And it was just him. And, oh man, it was so good. Did, uh, did, did they call you up to do a, to give a few zingers? No. And in fact, I I kept offering like I was backstage and I was like, uh, so just tell me how long you guys want me to do. And they're like, yeah, OK, OK. Yeah. You've got you've got your 17 shirts on. You're ready. To yeah. Hop yeah. Right back into the Come old on, bit. just for old time's sake, guys. Let me let me do the merch pitch. Yeah. Um, but no, I didn't do it. They, that tour. I think they had four different acts on it. So it was pretty jam packed. So I didn't get up and do any time uh, awesome. for that. So are you still touring with bands at all? No, I uh, actually that's not true. I did uh, like eight shows with um, Sidewalk Pro, uh, Sidewalk Profits. Yeah, Sidewalk Profits. That doesn't sound right. Uh, I did it in uh, 
last year. I should remember them. Um, sounds sounds. Fun. How do I not remember this? This is really embarrassing. Sidewalk projects. Um, profit sounds familiar. Big Tent Revival. Oh, BTR, bro. You don't remember BTR? I think that's who. <laughs> this is terrible. We've got to cut this part. No, don't don't cut this part. But let me um, let me look it up. This is so bad. Big Ten was a was a big band in the probably. Why can't 90s. I remember who the band was? But I only did um, I did like eight shows because I had a couple of weekends open, mm -hmm. and so they asked me if I would come out and just do a run with them. When this was is this? So embarrassing. This was in twenty twenty one. How do I not? I thought I followed him on Instagram, but maybe not. I could cut it if you want. It's all good. No, it's fine. I just like it's super embarrassing that I like hung out with these guys forever and now I can't remember well, their Welcome to Showbiz, everyone. Yeah, it was Sidewalk Profits. Yeah, I thought that sounded familiar. Yeah, Sidewalk Profits. Sorry. Not Big Tent Revival. But yeah, they were great. They were really cool. And and um yeah, they've kind of carved out their own niche. They have a huge fan base like everywhere. And so they're just playing these theaters and, you know, selling them out. And uh, it's just it's kind of cool that there's bands out there that, um, you know, maybe don't have a lot of radio play and stuff, but they have a niche and they can sell out, you know, little small theaters and just keep touring. And yeah, it was it, it was really fun. And it was a new group, like like it was a whole new fan base for me that you know didn't know who I was, and so it was it was really that was that was a fun little run. Are they uh, on the Christian market? Or are they quote mm -hmm. unquote secular? No, they're full on Christian. Like he, um, the lead singer, like definitely like preaches and shares testimony and stuff. You know, it's kind of different every night, but um, yeah, those guys are are good solid dudes. So how old were you at your last big tour? The last big tour? You yeah. Mean with, with bands? Yes, sir. Well, I did that uh, Sidewalk Profits uh, tour in 2021. Um, but again, that was only like eight eight shows. Um, it was just like two weekends. And um, then so I did the third day one in, I think it was like 08 or... No, no, no. It must have been like... 2012 or i don't know i'm really it all muddles together this is my 25th year doing this and so it just all muddles together that's what i was wondering so at that point when you transitioned from playing primarily with bands um you'd been doing stand-up for how long at that point 20 years well i quit touring with bands um it, it it's kind of hard to to have a definite time of saying okay this is when i quit because I would, I was doing my own shows, even like whenever I was touring, when I was doing the Love Liberty Disco Tour or Festival Candios, like I would go out and do their spring tour, but then I would do all summer dates, you know, just my own shows. Um, and then, you know, I would do a fall tour with a band, but, and on that third day tour that I did, and it must've been like 2012 or 2013 or something like that. Um, because they asked me kind of late in the game, like their tour was already booked and my show dates were, you know, pretty healthy at the time. And so uh, I missed, I missed probably 15 of the shows on their tour because I already had my own shows booked. And so there were, there were nights where the tour bus would roll through an airport at three in the morning, drop me off so that they could go on to their next date, but then I could fly out, do my date, and then I would fly back to another airport, and they would come in and pick me up on the way to the next show like that. The routing was a nightmare, but, you know, I was I had my own shows already booked, and, you know, I, I don't ever cancel. So um, we had to figure that that tour was, was pretty interesting. And at so, some point, you transitioned to doing primarily your own shows? Yeah, so after... Um, really after the love liberty disco tour uh, that i did with the newsboys uh that's whenever i started just like getting enough shows for the you know the year i was doing 80 to 90 shows a year of my own and that's whenever that was the that was the moment where i was like oh i think hang on i think i'm actually doing this this is how how slow i am i was sitting in my kitchen and i uh i had showed up on a dry erase board up on the wall and 
I don't know, this was like maybe year four or five into it. And I was working on this bit about a dog. And because I didn't set out to pursue comedy and I, you know, God just kind of opened the door and kind of really kicked me through it because I would have never gone on stage if I wouldn't have had this weird opportunity to all of a sudden go on tour. Um, and so I, I always in my mind, I thought I'm not a real comedian and someday somebody's going to figure that out. And then I'll go back to Texas and start teaching. You know, I just never. So I was working on this bit about about a dog and I was like, I don't even like this bit. And I don't even know why I'm working so hard on this. I'm not really a comedian. Um, and I looked up at the dry race board to see how many show dates I had to see like how long I was going to be a comedian for. And this is how slow I am. I looked up and I realized that I had like 60 shows booked for that year. And that was my light bulb moment of like, oh, I'm actually doing this. Like this is like I'm paying the bills and I have a ton of shows. I I guess I'm a comedian. You know, that was a moment I was like, OK, this this is actually working. You know, I just never thought because I just stayed busy and stayed on tours and would go out and do my own shows and stuff. And I never really sat down and thought, uh, man, I'm going to I'm going to make it as a comedian. You know, I just kept doing it and uh, God kept opening the doors. What you talked <laughs> about um, briefly was that imposter syndrome that um, if you have that, generally, you're not an imposter. <laughs> generally, you're doing it. It's the people yeah, actually, I worry about that that think, you know, they've already arrived and have it, you know. Yeah, there's um, whenever because I, I will mentor uh, some some comedians that are just starting out. And <clears throat> I always I always start by asking them, how much how much time can you do on stage? And if the comedian says, oh, I can do 45 minutes or an hour and they're just starting out, then I know they have this false confidence that, you know, they think they can do 45 minutes an hour. And if a comedian goes, Oh, I've, I've got about 10 minutes of good stuff. Then I'm like, Oh, this guy's going to make it because he's, yeah. you know, he's, he's realistic about what he can do because when you first start, everybody's terrible. You know, everybody's just really, it, it takes a long time to actually figure it out. And um, so are you doing um, non-Christian? Are you doing like club, the club circuit at all? Um, not a lot. Like I, I will do some comedy clubs if it just works out like with the routing and, and all that. But most, I would say 80% of the shows that I do are in churches and are for everybody, for families and stuff. Um, I'm doing this, this, I don't know when this is going to come out, but, um, this Friday I'm in, uh, Ord, Nebraska and I'm doing a theater. So it's just a theater that, you know, they just do a, a ticketed event and, uh, they're just doing a comedy show for the for the town. And um, so I, I do some some theaters. Uh, I don't do a lot of corporate events just because I don't like I book myself like I just I like that personal interaction. And thankfully, I get enough show offers that I don't need a booking agent. <clears throat> so I don't have to also pay, you know, 25 percent um, to a booking agent. But um, so I don't have a booking agent that books me for corporate events and uh, generally corporate events, they go through booking agents. So I don't do a lot of corporate events. I'm, I do maybe two or three a year. And usually it's like a Christmas banquet or, you know, something like that. Uh, but yeah, most, most of my shows are in churches. Have you ever done any of the, the Christian comedy tours? Um, well, I tour with uh, Hawkins a lot, like Tim Hawkins. Is that what you mean? Like just where it's yeah, a you know, they'll, they'll get three, you know, uh, Christian comedians and, um, you know, like, for the churches. Yeah. Um, Ken Kington used to uh, book the ultimate comedy tour and he, uh, he brought me and, and Hawkins out and uh, we did like tons of shows together um, back then. And yeah, it's, it's actually rare that a church brings in more than one comedian. Like if they bring in a comedian, they don't usually bring in two or three, but that does happen every once in a while. So I've done shows with Robert G Lee and, um, Carrie Pomeroli and you know every once in a while they'll bring in two or you know sometimes three uh also my friend Cleto Rodriguez he's got a club in uh San Antonio and so every once in a while I'll go do that and uh, you know it's kind of fun because you get to hang out with other comedians and stuff when you do the the churches do you ever start with like a church people joke you might be a Christian if you might, yeah, no, I try to, that's the thing. My, my show that I do in the comedy club is my show that I do in churches. Like it's, um, 
Yeah, I don't. I People always hear the word Christian comedian and they think, uh, oh, yeah, it's going to be a flannel graph or puppets or, you know, like it. And so we, we try to stay away from like cheesy stuff. We're trying to raise the bar. So when people hear Christian comedian, they think, oh, this is going to be good and it's going to be clean. And so, yeah, I, I try to. Yeah, I don't I don't just change stuff instead of uh, two lawyers walking to a bar. It's two deacons. You know, I don't I don't do stuff like that. Got any road stories? Any any, any anything interesting that anecdote that's happened along the way? Oh, uh, you want to hear horrible road gig stories? Yes, yes, I'd love to actually. So, okay, one one of the worst was I was doing this uh, big youth event, like a festival thing, and they had about eight hundred kids in a tent during the summer, so it was hot. They didn't have chairs, so everybody was sitting on the ground. And there was a girl that was uh, like on the second row. They were all just kind of crammed in there, but um, she was sitting and she just wouldn't quit talking. She just kept shouting out stuff to me. And so finally I was like, I ignored her at first, but then I was like, okay, I've got to shut her down. And so I turned and I can't remember what I said, but, and it wasn't super mean, but it just was the kind of let her know, hey, let me do my show, you know, quit trying to wreck it. And so I said something. And I later found out that she was bipolar and her youth leader was right there and he he didn't stop her or say anything. But so I said something and she burst out crying and she stood up because everybody was sitting on the on the ground and she stood up and she was like, you're the worst person in the world. I can't believe you hurt my feelings. Like, And then she started making her way to the back of the exit. But here's the thing. Because everybody was just sitting on the ground. She had to step over people. So it took her about four minutes. And the whole time she's going, you're horrible. Excuse me. Can I, I just need to step over here. You aren't even a Christian. You are. I, can you guys move over just a little bit so I can get like, and it was just, it was the absolute worst. It was just terrible. I did a, um, <clears throat> I did an event where they hired me. They had a racetrack. And they um it was a just a, like a, a race a race car track like um you know nascar but it was like a local thing um and they hired me they put the stage in the middle of the racetrack so the crowd was about 100 yards away from me that's horrible so you couldn't you couldn't even hear and they wanted me to do stand up the cars would come by and the crowd would cheer and then they wanted me to do stand up while the cars you're were lying going. no you're lying. no you're lying to me, to bro. No, it was the worst. And it was because they had a budget and they wanted to try it. And, you know, I don't say no to gigs because, you know, I've got five kids to support. And so I did that. I did a um, I did a show one time, a Super Bowl youth group party where they had the Super Bowl on the a huge screen on the stage, but they didn't want the kids watching the commercials. And so they didn't want them watching, you know, the Budweiser frogs and stuff. And so they hired me to do stand up when the commercials popped up, but they didn't even turn the screen off. They just muted the commercial. So the kids are watching these Budweiser frogs behind me while I'm up there and you can't time it. Like, so I would jump up and be in the middle of, of a bit and I could tell by the you know kids faces that the game was back on. And so then I just had to stop in the middle of the bit and just walk off. You know, it was it was the worst idea. This was rich people. This was uh, yeah, this was a pretty wealthy church. Oh, so it was for the whole church. It wasn't like a, a family. No, it was it would no, it was for uh, it was for their youth group. But youth their youth group. group had, you know, like 400 kids. Like it was a, a big youth group. So it was it was in a gym. So it was echoey. That's the thing about comedy. People, they have their own idea. They don't want you yeah. just to come here and do your show. They're always, they always have some special little idea. Like, um, you know, how about you dress as a broom and I'll sweep you in and then you just get up and do stand up. I'm like, how about you just let me do stand up? Like, let me just do, um, I got hired. The, there was a, a college and they got on buses and they did an all night thing. And so they would go and do bowling and then they'd go do laser tag and they do. And so uh, this lady hired me. Uh, to be on the bus the whole night. And then at the end, I would do a, a stand-up show. And so she said, 
I'm going to introduce you as like, you're my cousin who's down visiting and you know, this is who you're going to be so that nobody knew that there was going to be a comedy show because every, every place they went to was a surprise to the college kids, you know? So we'd pull up to a bowling alley and they'd be like, Oh, we're bowling. So she didn't want me saying that I, I did comedy. So they, you know, wouldn't know there was a comedy show. So she sent me a script with like a backstory of who I was and all this kind of, and I was like, no, can I just get on the bus and just hang out. And so as soon as we walked on the bus, two of the college kids was like, Oh my goodness, Bob Smiley. Like, like are you doing a show tonight? And I, I got to turn to her and go, sorry. You know, like, so I didn't have to pretend to be her cousin all night until my show. So yeah, people, yeah. people do this crazy thing where it's like, um, and I really, I, I spend so much time, you know, cause I'm a filmmaker and I, you know, did hip hop, Christian hip hop for years. And it's just dealing with people and their um, presumptions of, yeah. of, of being creative and that they can just hop in and be, a, and they're going to add to it. You're not a creative person, but you're going to add to the creativity. <laughs> it's kind of, uh, it, it's incredible. But uh, and, so some, and some people don't know, like I, I do a lot of uh, banquets, you know, or fundraisers or something. And they don't think through, maybe don't have people at the buffet getting food and sitting down and eating food while you're up there doing your show. So I have to actually ask them like, hey, everybody will be done eating, right? Because like it's huge distraction or they'll have waiters and waitresses come in. And I did a show actually in November, um, I did a show for uh, a youth detention. It was a prison, basically, but for high school kids, like um, like a, a juvenile attention center. Yeah. attention center. And so already it's a bad situation. And I'm I'm standing there and I'm talking to the warden and um, I'm like, what are, what are the kids like? And he's like, oh, they're pretty rough. This is going to this is going to be rough. And I was like, yeah, that's what I figured. And so they bring them in and it's only like 30 kids and they sit down and they're all just like, who are you? You know, like what? And so I start doing stand up and I start to get a couple of them. Like they start laughing and I'm like, okay, I can do this. And then they brought in popcorn and, um, in, in the uh, middle of your set, in the middle of my set. And the lady even walked in she was like, who wants popcorn? And I was like, no, you like I have to keep their attention. Like I'm fighting for my life up there to get these, you know, and like kids to to listen to me. And all of them were, like, hey, yeah, 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 popcorn. And I was like, so I, I was like, I'll take some popcorn because <laughs> this show's pretty much done. And Check, so, please. I, yeah, so I ate a bag of popcorn while I told stories that they didn't listen to. <laughs> and so, yeah, even now you still get in these really bad situations. Did you meet your uh, wife at a show? No, I don't know if you know my whole story. So I was married for 18 years. Um, she, uh, how do I say this politely, uh, met this other guy who had uh, way bigger uh, bank accounts than I did. And um, and she left. And uh, so I was a single dad with three kids for a long time. And then uh, I met the lady who I'm married to now, Sarah, Um the joke on stage, I say we we met online. Uh, we met on MySpace. Uh, it was awesome. We were the only two left. Um, that's the joke. But the real story is like we did. We met on a dating app. And uh, yeah, she I was on this dating app because it was so much entertainment because the stuff that people would write about themselves and all this stuff, it really was just comedy. And I would get all these, you know, I would get some people who knew me. I remember one lady, she messaged me and she was like, oh, my goodness, I didn't know you were single um, now. And uh, if we go out, can I bring my kids to the date? Because they're like super big fans. <laughs> I was like, oh, my goodness, this is going to be this is going to be interesting. So um, so I really wasn't dating a lot. And um, I opened up my app one day, just I'd landed and I, it was just fun to open up the app and like read all these crazy things like profile pics and uh, profile, you know, things that people write about. And, um, and I, I had messages and usually the messages are like sup or, you know, Oh, I saw you at a show or whatever. And I opened it up and there was this long, like I, I, I kid with her and tell her that she sent me a novel to read the first time, but she'd written all this stuff. And it talked about how much she loved Jesus and 
all this kind of stuff. And so it, at the time I really wasn't dating, but I was like, okay, I got to meet this, this person. So we met in Houston uh, we had a lunch date and uh, it just, where, that where'd was y'all it. go? What restaurant y'all go to? This is terrible, but I cannot remember where we went. Um, I don't go to Houston a lot. Like I stay out of the um, downtown. And uh, so I don't know the restaurants really. And it wasn't a, a chain. It wasn't like, you know, mm-hmm. like Waterburger or something like that. It was like a uh, place. She remembers. She's going to get mad if she listens to this. And like, how can you not remember the first place that we, um, but it had some weird like French name or something like that. And so you guys fell fast in love and. Yeah. Yeah. And she was living in Galveston. So there was like a you know, pretty big distance. Um, were and you, that already, was the thing. you were already in the woodlands at that time or. Yeah. I was in the woodlands at that time. Um, and the way the dating app works is you set your radius of how far like the person has to be um, from you and pop up. And so because I wasn't really interested in in dating, I had set my radius at 10 miles um, and she set her radius at 15 miles. She was a, a little more desperate than I am. And, um, <laughs> not really, I'm just throwing that in, but she really did. She, she had it set for 15 miles. So you have to be in the same vicinity within your radius for you guys to, to match or even show up. And then it shows you the profile and says, do you want to match with that? And then you swipe either right or left, you know, right. If you are interested or not. So we, she lived in Galveston and I lived in the woodlands, which was like 72 miles from each other. So we still can't figure out how we ever were in the same vicinity at the same time and was able to match. And this was a dating site that you couldn't message each other unless you both matched. And then the girl has to message the guy first. That's why I was on the app. I kind of liked it because it kind of protected women um, because women get bombarded on dating sites with just the worst I'm sure. Kind of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, that we somehow cross paths at the same time and God both worked it out. Together. Yeah, yeah, it really was. That's awesome, man. So, um, so we've been married uh four years. Uh December 15th was our four year. Congratulations. Yeah. So awesome. we're a blended family. So we and that's why we have five kids. So my two are Coulter, Trent, and Xander, and then my two bonus kids are Dylan and Mason. Nice. Yeah. Fresh ink, everybody. Um, so catch us up with what you got going on now, Work, working on some stuff. So now I'm, uh, well, during the quarantine, actually right before the quarantine, uh, I write this character. Is this, is this going to be video? Mm-hmm. It'll be on YouTube, okay. yeah. So that, that character I'm pointing to is uh, Average Boy. So uh, 20 years ago, Focus on the Family got my first CD and they liked it and they thought it like did well with kids like you know kids would like it which made sense because i was doing mostly youth groups at the time anyway and so they they contacted me and they said hey um we got your cd we liked it um would you ever consider writing a humor article we have uh, a magazine called clubhouse magazine for junior high kids and would you ever consider writing a humor article well growing up I never wanted to be a comedian, but I love Dave Barry. And there's a guy named Patrick F. McManus who wrote funny columns. And that was a bucket list of mine is I wanted to be published. Like I thought I'd be a teacher, but I wanted to get one comedy article published in a magazine somewhere. And so they contacted me and I was like, yeah, I'd love to do that. So uh, it was for their back to school issue. I wrote a, a true story about me getting a really bad haircut right before going back to school. But as I was writing it, I thought of a cell phone joke and it it was a it worked really well with the story. But I didn't have cell phones when I was a kid. So obviously it couldn't be me. So I just created this character and I just called him Average Boy. And it was just a modern day version of me in junior high. And it was only supposed to be one article. So I wrote that article, sent it in. They published it. And then they started getting a bunch of feedback from kids saying, hey, can Average Boy write, you know, a monthly column? And so I started doing that. And then I wrote two comedy devotion books as Average Boy for middle school kids. And those books sold really well. And um, so the month before everything shut down, like before COVID, you know, like just shut everything down, Focus on the Family contacted me and they said, hey, um, would you consider doing an average boy podcast and you, you do the voice of average boy on the podcast and it would be for families to listen to. We'd keep it short. So it was like 20 minutes long uh, for, you know, for families to listen to on the way to church or to school and stuff like that. And we didn't know if it would work or if people would listen to it. And so 
I agreed to do 13 episodes uh, for free just to see how it would go. And so we we recorded 13 episodes. We put them out, you know, wherever people get podcasts and it blew up. And then, of course, the quarantine hit oh, yeah. and everybody was was at home. And so the Average Boy podcast. So that's what I'm doing now is I, a lot of my time when I'm not on the road is uh, I'm still writing for Clubhouse Magazine, a monthly article. Um, I put out a third Average Boy book. Uh, it's not a comedy devotion book. It's just a, a fiction comedy book. Like it's like Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Um, it's just about average boy going to a new school, but there's a lot of moral stuff in there. Like he has to deal with some bullies and some stuff like that, but it's just like a comedy book and uh, it's called average boys above average year. So I wrote that during the quarantine. That book, um, uh, is out now. I do the average boy podcast. And so, uh, yeah, this, it's kind of funny. Average boy has kind of turned in its own separate career. So I do that and uh, then just out traveling and doing shows. Now I'm currently working um, of course, I've done the movie Lion Killer, which is behind me, and my short films. And uh, I'm currently working on a, on a, my first graphic novel. Have you ever thought about doing a average boy comic book? It seems like that medium would would lend well to that character. Yeah, we honestly, you know, we've got it, and and it's got a good following now. And so we're trying to decide what to do. Uh, with it do we want to put out a cartoon do we want to you know uh, do a comic book like that um, right now the the comedy books are doing really well like uh, kids are like the the third book that came out average boys above average year um, it's sold out on amazon and completely like sold all, the first run like normally a publishing company will print a certain amount and that'll last a couple of years and they like I can't even get my book now. Like I, I can't. They're they're going to have some new ones at the end of January um, that hopefully they'll ship to me. But yeah, I, I sold out um, of those books. So, um, yeah, we're trying to decide what what the next step is, because uh, it, the, the podcast is going really well and the books are doing really well. So, yeah, we we've definitely got that, you know, in the idea folder. Yeah, it seems like seems like you could do a lot with that character. And uh... yeah. That's awesome. It's doing so well. So yeah. tell me, 25 years in the biz, is it, has it been 25? Uh, 25, yeah. 25 years in the biz, um, walking as a Christian most of your life, divorced, remarried. What's the big lessons you've learned? One of them, um, I actually got this from Hawkins, because um, Tim Hawkins was the first guy I called when I kind of figured out what all was going on and I knew my world was about to crash and all this kind of stuff. And I called him and uh, explained what was going on. And um, he gave me the best advice. He said, don't go through this alone. Um, and then of course he made a joke. He said, you can call my Butler anytime uh, that you need to talk to somebody. But, um, but he said, don't go through it alone. And, and I think that's the, one of the biggest lessons that I learned was God has built us for community. And, you know, that's why the pandemic was so bad for people. And, and we need to be invested in each other's lives. And, you know, we need to just be open and vulnerable and and really share what's going on. And, you know, there's so much the pandemic was so bad. There's so much depression and people dealing with stuff and all that. And I just feel like we're all built for community and we need to you know have each other's backs and checking in with each other and stuff like that. So that's that's been a, a, a great lesson. Uh, probably, you know, one of the most important ones. So I would get the kids to school and then I would just sit in an empty house and I could just feel this cloud of depression like coming over me. And I'd pick up the phone and I'd call, you know, Hawkins or I'd call, you know, Darren Streblo or, you know, some of my comedy friends. And uh, that really helped me get through that that rough time. Um, and then the other other lesson I guess I would share with people is that God can use you wherever you're at. Like if you for a while, I thought I was like too broken. I didn't know if I'd ever even be able to do stand up. I didn't know if churches would even hire me as, you know, even though it wasn't my choice, if they would hire me as a divorced you know, person, because divorce used to be this big taboo thing. And what I found was that churches actually wanted me to come and talk about going through a divorce and, you know, having to, to deal with that kind of stuff, because a lot of marriages are under attack and people are struggling and. So I was that was I was pleasantly surprised that churches really wanted me to to do that. One of the first shows I ever did back like right after everything happened was um, Huntsville State Prison. 
uh, they contacted me and they were like, hey, we heard you're going through some stuff. Will you come do a show for our prisoners? And I had never been to a prison. And, you know, I was at the lowest point of my life and I I agreed to do it. And I went there and it I went to encourage them and I left being so encouraged like they were they were so great. And I remember um, I used to I used to do this bit about my voice being high. And so the joke is, um, you know, I'm the protector of my family. So if uh, if you were a burglar breaking in downstairs and I was at the top of the stairs, would this scare you? And then I lean over and I go, you better not be down there. Like, that's a joke. And it gets it gets a big laugh. And well, I didn't think through my show. I just got up and started doing a show for the prisoners. And I actually said to a room full of prisoners, pretend you're a burglar breaking in, in downstairs. And one of the guys yelled out, don't have to pretend. And, <laughs> yeah, like, so it was great. And I got to like make them laugh and realize that God could still use me even in a, you know, in the place that I was at, you know, really kind of broken and everything. And that God could still use me to bring some laughter and joy and encouragement. I got to talk about Jesus uh, to these prisoners. Although halfway through, I kind of ruined it because I remember the guy that um, my ex is married to now. Uh, at the time, he lived up, up near Huntsville. And so I shouldn't have done this, but I said to I said to the prisoners, by the way, if any of you are getting out soon, um, <laughs> I would love to share an address with you. So, And afterwards, they I, I brought my oldest son with me because I thought it'd be good for him to see. And they all, you know, got up and hugged me and thanked me for coming and thanked my son for coming. And one guy leaned in. And he goes, seriously, all I need is that dude's name. And, <laughs> yeah. So I gave it to him. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, but that's so that's another thing I learned is that God can continue using you like you, you know, like I think sometimes we feel so broken or something that that God can't use us, but he can. He, the Bible is full of people that he used, you know, that were that were broken, you know. And didn't have their life together, but God can use you. Awesome. One last thing. Um, and for me, this is an important question as a creative, you know, I struggle with a lot of just, just a lot of creative issues, but what advice do you have out there? For someone out there who wants to make a career in um, the creative arts. So I'll, I'll tie this all back to Seinfeld again. Um, Seinfeld was in his apartment and uh, he was looking out, he was in New York and he was looking out and he was supposed to be writing, you know, working on his act. <clears throat> and he looked out and he saw these construction workers and they were coming back from lunch and they were tired and they just, you know, they just looked like worn out. And he looked at him and he was like, they don't want to go back to work, but that's their job. That's their job. And so they need to show up every day and do their job. And he said that that had an impact on him because he realized his job is a comedian. So he needs to write every day. He needs to put in the time and not be lazy and, and actually treat it like a, a job that I need to show up every single day and do it. So when I encourage like young comics or, you know, even people that are getting in a film and stuff like that, I'm like, realize it is your job. So you don't have, you're not clocking in nine to five or anything, but you've got to put in a day's work every single day. If you really are, you know, you feel like you're called to this or this is what you want to do, then do it. Like put in the effort, like put in the work. And so that's, I'd always encourage you. I always tell people that are wanting to get into comedy, write every single day. Even if you don't feel funny, just sit down and write because you never know if, you know, when the creative you know, process is going to all of a sudden explode and you've got to sit down and, and, and try to do it every single day. And you'll be surprised at stuff you'll write that you don't think is good that you can then go back and look at it and be like, oh, no, nah. you know, you can think of a tagline or something, how to punch it up and and it actually works out. So, yeah, show up every day and do it. Well, thank you for your time, Bob. I appreciate it. It was it was not only insightful, it was encouraging and very funny. Um, I'll put all your links in the description. And um, man, if you're ever in the Houston area, hit me up. We'll go have a cup of coffee or something, man. Yeah, that'd be great. Or put me in a movie. <laughs> whoa, wait, hey, whoa, whoa, wait, buddy. <laughs> Anytime. It'd be my pleasure, man. It'd be my pleasure. All right, man. I'll talk to you later. All right. I'll see you. Thanks for having me on. All right, man. Thanks again, Bob, for being on the show. You're a very funny man. And I appreciate you coming on and sharing your life and your journey with us here today. If you want to check out Bob when he's in your area, his links are in the description. Make sure you follow him and catch him at a show near you. You can also follow me on Twitter to stay up to date with everything that's going on with my new graphic novel, 
The Gentleman's Guild. Yes, I'm making a graphic novel. It's called The Gentleman's Guild. Artist E. By Canalis is doing the art. That's right, the E. By Canalis is crushing the art on The Gentleman's Guild. Follow The Gentleman's Guild. The link is in the description. And don't forget to watch Lion Killer, my debut feature film. That's right, I made a movie. It's called Lion Killer. It stars Regina Ting Chen, who's currently on season four of Stranger Things. You can watch it at Amazon Prime, Tubi TV, Freevee, the Roku channel, or you can pop on over to the YouTube channel called V Movies. And thanks for watching this episode of Fury Cast. And also, don't forget to like this video, comment down below, or simply leave me a pound Fury Cast to let me know you're watching. You can also subscribe and yes, smash that bell so you can be notified every time I drop a video. Well, that's all for today. Until next time, peace.